Welcome, everyone. Demo Day is back to in person. <laughs> Um, so my name is Salome Sega, and I'm the director of New Inc, New Museum's cultural incubator for creative practitioners working across art, design, technology, and science. Um, I'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement. To recognize a land as an expression of gratitude and appreciation to, to those whose territory you reside on, and a way of honoring the indigenous people who have been living and working on the land before us. It is important to understand the long-standing history that has brought you to reside on this land, and to seek to understand your place within that history. We would like to acknowledge the Leni Lenape people who are the original inhabitants of Lenape Hoking in the island of Manhattan. For the last two years, New Inc. has primarily been a virtual program and we're taking steps to hybridize. Last month, we moved into, the temp into our temporary space at 250 Hudson in the Hudson Square while our home next door gets a renovation. We're so excited to have shared workspace again with our members, uh, including the Rhizome team who also works from our offices. Uh, we've been very, very busy this cohort year, so I just want to give a snapshot of the things that we've been doing and also what's coming up. Uh, we just closed our annual open call and are in the middle of reviewing applications. We will welcome a new cohort, co cohort nine, in, uh, at the end of August. New Inc. is in the middle of a year-long partnership with Ace Hotel, where we're hosting public programs at both of their uh, both of their Manhattan and Brooklyn locations. In March, XR member Brandon Powers, who's presenting today, uh, created an immersive audio experience, an intimate uh, performance called Public Private that led audiences through the Ace Hotel Brooklyn. In April, we hosted a panel with the team behind Somewhere Good, uh, a newly launched social media app with an aim to host healthy conversations uh, online with new design conven conventions that move away from infinite scrolls, likes, and followers. Collective Abundance member Johan Diedrich is part of the Somewhere Good team and will also be presenting today. Uh, we're hosting our next program in July where we'll discuss music, technology, labor, nightlife economies. So look out for, for an email about that. In partnership with Onassis Foundation, New Inc. has also been hosting public programs at Onyx Studio, an extended realities accelerator program and presentation space in the Gallery of Olympic Tower in Midtown. We have a busy month ahead at Onyx, which includes a screening and catalog launch of XR member Peter Burr's Responsive Eye next week on the 12th. Peter is also presenting today. Whoop, whoop. Uh, we're also kicking off a new artist-led conversation series, guest curated by, curated by New Inc. alum Reese Donahue. The first conversation features artist Marion Bonani and musician Lorraine on May 17th. Uh, in the first week of June, we're hosting a showcase of our XR Tracks work uh, to coincide with the Tribeca Festival. Um, and also, Onyx is looking for members. So if you're interested, please visit the Onyx website. It's onyx.studio. Or um, you can just find me at some point in this program, and I can tell you how to get involved. Um, and then we're also hosting a showcase of our creative science members' work on July 14th at New Lab in Brooklyn Navy Yard. OK, so a little bit about today. So New Inc. is a place where artists, designers, and technologists come to plant a seed. And through our professional development program and mentorship offerings, uh, New Inc. Tends, tends to these seeds and in hopes of a wild bloom. Demo Day is a moment to celebrate the projects, initiatives, and studios that members have launched or are in the process of launching and finding avenues for continued support. This year, uh, year eight cohort is a special is special to me not only because I joined with you all, um, but because y'all don't play. <laughs> your tools are sharp and your visions are clear, and I'm excited that you get to share some of this work today. Uh, I want to give a couple of thanks before passing it off to Raul. Uh, I want to thank the Meta Open Arts team for recognizing how meaningful Demo Day is to our members and our extended community. Thank you for supporting this annual program uh, where New Inc. can share out. Uh, thank you to Derek Wright for your production support and to our ASL interpreters from Body Language Productions. Uh, thank you, Ikra LaRode and team for live streaming for your live streaming support. Thank you, Christine Rivera, for documenting, ev documenting every New Inc. program. You've become like our visual storyteller. Uh, and Pablo Ogun for, for designing the stage that will make everyone look really cool today. 
Uh, and last but not least, I want to thank the New Ink team. Uh, all of us joined during the pandemic and are conjuring something new together. Uh, this team moves with care, moves with love, moves with questions and instinct. This cohort year would be, wouldn't, wouldn't be anything without you all. Uh, so that's Raven, Maddie, Andrea, and Raul. When you see them at the reception, <laughs> toast, toast them. <laughs> So with that, I'll, I invite Raul to the stage. Thank you. Hi. Hi, I'm Raul Zbengetch. I'm the new Associate Director of Operations and Public Programs for New Inc. Um, thank you. <laughs> thank everybody for coming out on a rainy day. Hopefully we can brighten it a little bit. I just want to describe a little bit about how today is going to play out. So demo day this year takes place in two parts with one intermission. Um, in each part, you're going to hear our track members present about their work, followed by a, a, feed, or, um, a response and a question session with the track mentors. Uh, the first two tracks to present are Art and Code and Collective Abundance. We're going to take an intermission. And then our second two tracks to present are XR and Future Memory. And to cap it all off, we'll have a keynote with American Artist. So I'm going to read out the, the next six presenters, and then I will let them take the stage. So from Art and Code, we will have Carrie Sija Wang, Rupa Vasudevan, and Cassie Tarakajian, with a response by Celine Wong Katzman. And for Collective Abundance, we'll have Eliza Evans, Laudi Kolab, and Johan Diedrich with a response by Emmanuel Admasu. So without further ado, please welcome Carrie Sija Wang. Come on up. Hello, alien. I am here to guide you through the unidentified space alien entrance test. What's your name? Carrie. Oh no no. What's your real name? Huang Sijia. Okay. Monster Jam, where are you from? Alrighty, Monster Jam, smile your biggest smile in front of the camera. So, this is the beautiful planet a paradise that promises its inhabitants a dream life. Every year, millions of alien entities from across the universe land on the beautiful planet, hoping to gain entry, to stay, and to have a little piece of that paradise. And to be able to enter, the first step is to pass the entrance test. The test uses surveillance technologies such as face tracking and speech recognition to turn the test takers into quantifiable data sets. The data is then analyzed by the planet's integration and acceptance committee, which is a opaque authority that makes decisions about whether you're worthy of staying on the planet. I call this test the Unidentified Space Alien Entrance Test, or USAET. This is a browser-based interactive experience, and it's also a critique on Byzantine immigration systems. It can be played online or in an installation. My name is Carrie Sija Wang. I am an artist, designer, and educator based in New York. My work combines art, technology, and research, and is often situated in the space between game and test, fiction and reality, the rational and the absurd. In my work, I often create fictional systems to reflect and provoke critical thinking about real, complex systems of power and control. In this performance work titled The System, I created a fake government department that tests candidates' ability to generate system-compliant content. This is another project of mine called An Interview with Alex. It takes the participant into this 12-minute job interview with an artificial intelligence HR manager. And the story is set in the near future of gamified work and ubiquitous digital surveillance. 
unidentified space alien entrance test is my latest work in progress. And it is one of my most personal projects so far. I created USA ET based on my own experience of moving to the US and my years of attempts to try and integrate myself into the culture here. The project aims to create a tangible test that casts light on the invisible and elusive standards of assimilation. The desired outcome of the project is to not only bring immigrant communities together to share stories, but to provide people outside of these communities a way to learn about and empathize with the immigrant experience. So with a nuanced mix of humor, playfulness, and a little bit of discomfort, the test parodies the absurd, often insurmountable idiosyncrasies of immigration authorities. The installation version of the test will exist in a custom design phone booth. Participants will line up outside of the booth and there will be monitors mounted from the ceiling playing a Welcome to the Beautiful Planet video on the loop. So the project is currently in the phase of prototype. Once launched, the test will be used as a conversation starter for participants to share their own experiences, start discussions about the current immigration system, and imagine a better future together. As the conversations go on, I will also like to update the test to include participants' own experiences with immigration and assimilation. I will also like to collect artifacts such as consented recordings of different people taking the test and interviews with people about their experiences in migration over generations. The project is process-driven and ever-evolving. As more participants become involved, more artifacts will be produced. So I envision myself working on USA ET for the next few years and gradually develop this single interactive experience into its own universe. I am looking for organizations that work with immigrant communities to collaborate with. I am also looking for places that could potentially show the installation version of the project. In addition to traditional museums and galleries, the installation version of the project could also be installed in places like the lobby of a government building to provoke conversations. I am also looking for funding to support the technical development of the experience, as well as the design and build of the phone booth. So I have issued 200 unique alien numbers today. Um, and everyone here should be able to find it in the back that you're getting. So if you're interested in testing out prototypes, you can USA. Um, you can visit usaet.org and enter the alien number that you have on the sticker and wait for the integration and acceptance committee to get back to you. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Please be in touch. Hi, everyone. My name is Rupa Vasudevan, and I'm a media artist and a researcher. And I'm going to start out by saying something that might feel a little bit controversial in this space. Technology moves way too fast for me. And this is probably a strange thing to hear from an artist who's working primarily with the internet. You might think, if you can't keep up with technology, how on earth have you built your art practice around it? And the thing is, I do love technology. It's promise its capacity to bridge distance and make our lives easier, and its ability to keep us connected, especially in light of the two years that we've all just experienced. But two things can be true at the same time, and I do get really overwhelmed by the speed at which everything changes. There just doesn't seem to be any time to pump the brakes and consider context. Everything hinges on immediacy. Reactions, updates, the demand for instant gratification. Most of the time, I want everything to just slow down for a second so I can catch up, instead of constantly feeling like I'm behind the curve. 
Fittingly, it has taken me a while to realize that this discomfort with technological speed has actually shaped the core of my art practice. But I now see that from the very beginning of my almost decade-long career, my work has centered duration and accumulation in many different formats and across a variety of mediums. I'm less concerned with pushing projects out at a rapid pace, and more so with building something complex with layers that evolves and takes on multiple meanings in different contexts and spaces, that speaks to emotion, humor, and individual experience, and that rewards people for spending a considerable period with it over time, and maybe even returning to it on multiple occasions. And often this extends to envisioning multiple output formats within the same project. So for example, with my project Data Double that you see here, my work is able to be experienced online as a browser extension, but also in a gallery as a series of risograph portraits, and in print as a self-published zine. In working with multiple and intersecting outputs like these, I strive to bridge practice and research. I'm both of these things together and they can't be separated. My work also has a labor intensive, physically demanding and material aspect to it that points to the very real costs to human identity and agency that are often forgotten when we think about digital. I tend to work in multiplicity, creating repetitive or familiar forms where everything looks similar but leads to slightly different outcomes. Rather than making big leaps forward, I focus on small iterations, taking something that we think we know and changing it ever so slightly to make it do something different. This is evident in my recent project, Slow Response, which currently exists as a series of 100 manually drawn QR codes. In each drawing, I experiment with form, pattern, texture, and color to test the boundaries of when the codes will scan and when they won't. The codes that do scan link to mobile websites that offer meditations on speed, form, and the rush toward futurity. The project points to the expectations that we formed at an exponential rate for a technological system, as well as a reluctance to move at a slower, more deliberate, and measured pace. I think of my work as a call to action, galvanizing people to learn more about their increasingly digital lives and ripping people away from a passive technological autopilot. I'm driven by strong values and a desire to bring others into a space of critical self-reflection. These ideals deeply inform a social practice and cultural organizing project that I've been developing over the past two years, which asks artists and creative technologists to situate themselves within the power structures of big tech and surveillance capitalism, rather than on the outside looking in. The project stems from my research toward my PhD at the University of Pennsylvania and exemplifies my pursuit of bridging research and practice toward tangible, impactful outcomes. Spanning a series of workshops, collaboratively written manifestos, and public art engagements, the project aims to provide space for collective care and support for artists working within these systems, a way to reframe and redefine what agency and resistance look like in our work, and an ethical foundation for more just and humane technological futures. I'm sending you each home today with a magnet containing the seven prompts for the creative resistance workshops that form the backbone of this project. I hope that you will put this in a place where you will encounter it every day and that it will motivate you to continually reflect on these ideas in your own lives. And ultimately this project, like my practice as a whole, wants to remind us that while technology's quick pace and engulfment of our lives seems inevitable, it doesn't have to be. Because as it turns out, we still do have agency and we can use it to pause and make informed choices about whether and how we engage. If you resonate with the feeling of wanting to slow down, I would love to connect with you. I'm looking for more chances to share my work, my thought process, and paths towards creative self-reflection with others. I would love to schedule a studio visit with you to chat about exhibition opportunities, both online and offline, or figure out ways to run workshops, collaborate on writing and publication, or engage in other kinds of public programming. I'm also pleased to say that I have work up throughout the rest of the month in two exhibitions in Philadelphia, where I'm based, at Automat Collective and at the Painted Bright Art Center. So if you find yourself in town, I would love to take you through the shows myself. Thank you all so much, and I'm looking forward to continuing these conversations with you.
Hey everyone, um, I'm Cassie Tarakagian, and today I'm going to introduce you to a project called Bless Slash Blur Slash Cursed. Just to whet your appetite, this is a smattering of images I generated with machine learning that make me feel deeply uncomfortable because they look almost, but not quite like me. Um, but first, I'd like to introduce my real self. Um, I am a technologist working on creative coding tools. I'm an educator, and I'm an artist. Um, my relationship to technology began as a kid growing up in the internet. It was a place for me to have fun, and I spent it on websites such as Neopets, caring for my virtual pets, and playing flash games. And, but then as I grew up, I watched the internet change to a place controlled by a small number of powerful technology companies who often don't have our best interests in mind. So as a technology artist, I often bring both a playful and critical perspective. One practice I have is noticing things that I find to be both funny and disturbing. I fervently collect photos, screenshots, videos, and other media that I encounter in my everyday life. For example, this is something that the Etsy algorithm re recommended I buy when searching for beads for jewelry making. It says, for sale is a bag of 100 loose teeth. Uh, I think we all experience these small failures of technology, but perhaps just brush them off. I instead collect them. But sometimes these failures are much larger. The film Cats came out in 2019, and it was supposed to be an achievement of cinema, where technology would enable the magic of realistic looking singing and dancing cats. But instead, the CGI was so disturbing that you could barely stand to look at the cats' bodies. It's depressing to waste $95 million on something unwatchable, but yet the irony is hilarious. People thought that this terrible film was cursed, even a sign of the beginning of the downfall of civilization. I loved that I now had a word to describe the simultaneous feeling of joy and disgust. Armed with this new term, cursed, I decided to dig deeper. I felt that this research was more than just some silly little images I was collecting, so I decided to collaborate with my friend and fellow curse connoisseur, Adam Roxar, and turn this research into a 14-week graduate course. We actually just finished teaching the class for a second time. Um, and we explore many different types of uncomfortable feelings about art and technology, such as liminality, the uncomfortable feeling of being in between in real life and in the metaverse, the uncanny valley, the uncomfortable feeling of seeing something that feels almost human, but you can tell that it's not, uh, the fine line between cute and monstrous, uh, the horror of 3D graphics, because we can make anything, but someone really needs to stop us. Uh, and one of my favorite deeply cursed spaces is machine learning. There's so much hype around these algorithms, and yet often they are pretty bad. We can ask the algorithm to generate bad memes for us, like this one, uh, exposing the biases of the data it was trained on. This one asks us to weigh being straight and being a good person. Uh, we can also generate mediocre music, too. I've been seeding music I wrote to algorithms, trying to generate music that sounds like Uncanny Me. But to me, it just kind of sounds like Cursed Joan Baez from The Sims. <laughs> We can also generate bad erotica. This algorithm, GPT-2, was trained on Reddit, an archive of our own, which is a fan fiction website. I wrote the first sentence, and the algorithm did the rest. Sufjan rubbed Drake's back as he kissed him gently on the cheek. Don't cry for me. I know you're a good dude. Thank you, Drake said, reaching forward to kiss the fallen angel's cheek. But I'm dying now. We can also interrogate how the algorithm sees us. I uploaded an image of myself to a machine learning tool called Art Breeder, and using some sliders, I can edit this image. For example, I can see what I would look like happier. Or I can see what I would look like if I had inherited my, more of my father's Armenian genes. Don't worry, there are other incredibly problematic sliders uh, on this website, such as Asian, Indian, and Black. And this technology is supposed to revolutionize the world. Once I move through the feelings of deep sadness, I can laugh at the infinite number of uncanny Cassies I can create, and you will be able to take one of those home with you today. And then I can pick myself back up again and focus on building the world that I want. 
I believe laughter in the face of discomfort can help us connect and dream of ways to build a better future for ourselves. When we laugh at scary things, such as dystopian technology, they can feel smaller. Absurdity, absurdity can also help us break assumptions and think expansively. Content on the internet may feel trivial, but these are things we come across every day. Why not ask how they make us feel? Now that I've done this as a successful graduate course, I'm looking to expand. It's a fairly new project, so I'm looking for, honestly, just validation. Like, I want to know that this resonates with you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I, I, sometimes I feel like I think about this in a niche way, so would like some validation. Um, also collaborators, especially folks with different skills from me. And lastly, just space to make one of my cursed dreams come true, such as I mean, having a cursed art show, public programming, or workshops about engaging with the internet in a critical and playful way, online tutorials about how to make cursed art, uh, a comedy show where we watch cursed TikToks together, or a performance where I duet with a bad AI. So thank you so much for your time and attention, and this is how you can contact me. Thank you, everyone. Um, hi everyone, my name is Celine Katzman. I'm curator at Rhizome, co-director at SFPC, the School for Poetic Computation, and I'm also the mentor for the Art and Code track this year. Um, <laughs> thank you all, that was so fun. <laughs> um, and that's actually what I wanna ask about. So I think something that really defines this cohort is our ability to talk very seriously about technology in a critical way and its social and political impact. Real heavy, heavy, heavy stuff. But we always manage to laugh together, have a great time, like be in community. And I feel like that is a quality that like shows up in all of your practices. Um, you're all interested in humor and the absurd and like building community in some way or interacting with community. And so I guess I wanted to invite you to expand upon um, the role of humor in your practice and community in your practice. I guess I can start. Um, uh, I, I, I like to think of um, generating cognitive dissonance in my work and kind of taking something, like I said in my presentation, that we think we know and we think we have a good idea about and tweaking it and making it just absurd enough that you notice kind of what something is wrong and something is going on. And to me, using humor and using absurdity in that way kind of points at the manufacturedness of technology a little bit about how these are systems that we take for granted, that we use in our everyday lives, that have become so integrated into the way that we operate in the the world that we don't really think about how they're used um, and making them a little bit absur absurd and kind of playing to that um, instinctual you know uh, wanting to laugh or wanting to have an emotional reaction it gets you to take a step back and think about why these practices are default in the first place um, which I think is really it can be a really useful tool to kind of get people to stay, take a step back and be a little bit more critical in the ways that we want in our in our work in our practices yeah, I completely agree with Rupa. <laughs> um, and um, I agree that um, um, a lot of things in our life are already very absurd. It's just that we don't notice them that much. <laughs> um, so through, um, I think all of our work, um, like in my projects, I um, make things more absurd so that, like Rupa said, you notice. Um, and also humor in my work often comes in uh, the form of the experiences that I create, because a lot of the experiences that I create are in, uh, framed as games. Um, and the surface level fun and playfulness of the games would, I hope, lure people in to go through the experiences. And then they will kind of realize that it's not just a game, it's also a test. 
and something on the other side of the system is judging them in a way that makes them feel a little bit uncomfortable. But still they feel entertained because they know it's a game and it's not real, but they feel uncomfortable. So it's this ambiguity and um, the blurry line between game and test, fiction and reality. Um, that's something that I'm aiming for. And I hope through this ambiguity, um, people can spend more time thinking about the experiences and their connection to reality. I think that's um, that's something that I see in Cassie's work too. Um, there's different levels of interpretation. There's this surface level of playfulness, but you can also choose to think more about it. Yeah, totally. Um... I think for me, in like bringing bringing humor into my work, um, it actually it actually falls back to like my background is in engineering, and the way that informs my work now was like when I first started like getting into te into technology and like learning how to code, I felt like like the computer was always right and I was the person that was wrong, and like now that I um, that's kind of like flipped for me. I like see how brittle all of these systems are and I'm like, oh, like all these things are so stupid. They're just like designed by a person, like whatever. Like for me, not only does humor like create, create space to like critique and interrogate them, it makes them smaller. It makes it feel like, oh, well, it makes me feel empowered. Like, oh, I can just like make something better. Not in a like, I'm like a Silicon Valley like CEO and like I can make something better, but like we can come together and make something better more like. And I think like humor is also so accessible. Like for me, that that's like a value in my work is like access and like when we can laugh about things, like, like everyone can like laugh about some dumb thing that we encounter in our everyday life. And then it feels like we have, we can be empowered to like do something about it. Okay, well, thank you all so much for sharing with us. It was truly a pleasure. Thank you, Celine. Thank you, Celine. <laughs>
where the subterranean is a private property. So if it's private property, my private property, I can say no to the frackers, right? No, if you only have three acres, uh, the, the fossil fuel companies have made it very difficult to say no. The lawyers I consulted simply suggested I sign the lease, take the money, and if the property were fracked, I would collect royalties for the life of the well. You see my earlier decision to become an artist that might be attractive. Um, so, so if the law makes it difficult to say no to frackers, but a survivable future means I have to, I get, well, a survivable future means I can't say yes to them, there's one choice left, and that's to become a pain in the ass. So instead of giving frackers what they want, I created All the Way to Hell as an art project, wherein I am giving away the mineral rights to as many people as possible. And that means the frackers have to track down the new owners and it make a good faith effort to attempt to negotiate a lease. They have to buy a lot of stamps, give lawyers money. Um, and so breaking up the property certainly slows down the development of the well and it democratizes an asset that should have been a commons to begin with. So to date, more than 7,000 people have signed up to own this property, uh, which means each new owner owns a few square feet, 4,000 miles deep to the center of the earth. So they found the project through gallery exhibitions, public art installations, traditional and social media, and then TikTok found me, and here we are. So here's the third bad idea, which is why I'm here today. So through All the Way to Hell, I learned that mineral right owners have very few options for resisting fracking. There are mineral right owners out there who are being fracked, and they don't have a choice about it. And they are receiving royalties. What if we created a way for those mineral owners to pool their resources, the, well, mineral owners with conscience and a brain, to, to, to pool their resources and support and empower climate resistance. So just to give you an idea of the scale of what I'm talking about, here's a map of US oil and gas reserves. 75% of those reserves are privately owned. Now, if we're able to mobilize just a tiny minority of mineral, mineral owners who are currently being fracked, maybe just 1%, that still means $220 million a year, what kind of change do you think we would be able to achieve? We don't know because no one has tried it. So here's the job. Let's create the all the way to hell climate justice fund to attract and manage mineral properties and associated royalties distribute the money to where it can do the greatest good. Now this is, mineral rights are complex assets, so this has to be a complex solution, but all we have to do, do it, is a radically practical approach to the challenge of extraction, and we don't need a new technology, a new policy, or anyone's permission to do it. And this is where y'all come in. Um, I'm looking for smart, clever people to help out. If you're willing to pitch in, there is a role for you. Uh, over the summer, I'll be developing the business plan for the Climate Justice Fund, and so I especially need legal accounting and finance folks to help design a nimble organization that regulators will tolerate, yet still empowers climate activists. And I know this room is full of storytellers, so if you can help share and help tell the story, I'd really appreciate it. So go to allthewaytohell.com to learn more about the project and maybe become a mineral owner yourself. Uh, the Oklahoma signups are open until the end of the month, so join up. Um, yeah, so thanks very much, and I look for, forward to talking afterwards.
<laughs> Ready? Hi, everyone. I'm Gloria Lau. And I'm Daphne Lundy. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and we make up Loudy Collab. I live on Ocean Avenue. And I live on Ocean Parkway. So we're friends, and also we have been spending five years organizing together. On our neighborhood walks, we talk about our professional training in urban planning and how it connects with communities. We talk about landscape architecture and print making as it relates to my professional and art background. And my love of textiles and popular education. And how we can use these practices, practices to reach an equitable future. All of these topics are tied to our essential passion for people, spaces, and places. Built environment professions tend to be really professional, uh, prioritizing formal knowledge and leaving little room for community knowledge or community stories. That's why we created Laudi CoLab, an arts-based design practice that seeks to amplify community stories in the built environment that have been erased or undervalued. So where we come from shapes a lot of what we're curious about. We're both city kids growing up, I grew up in Hong Kong and immigrated to the California suburb when I was a teenager. And I grew up in Crown Heights and Flatbush and found my way back to Brooklyn after grad school. So we have been our school for quite a while, but we find ourselves in a constant state of unlearning and learning. Trying to prove from the lessons of elders, looking into the past to better understand the present and the future. But we know how hard it can be to access that information because of the way certain story and history are valued over others. It is that if we need some sort of wormhole to better reach the past from the present. So as people who care about communities and places and reaching a more liberatory future, how do we better access the lessons of the past? We want our work to be driven by an ethos of human-centered urbanism, where we're connecting to people and their stories and experiences of spaces. And we believe that knowing yourself is to know about the places that you inhabit. And in order to better situate the present conditions and realize more expansive futures, we need to know the histories and experiences of elders. In essence, we want to tell histories that center people in the built environment. So during New Inc, we have been prototyping projects to refine our collaborative approach, design and research methodology, and increase Bay arts for storytelling. We both spent time in 99 cent stores, but we, what we knew about them was limited. For our analysis, we learned that there are over 1,300 99 cent stores in New York City. That data point became a launching pad for our prototype. This past March, we shared our exploration as part of the Data by Design exhibit. This exhibit gave us the space to explore the concepts of 99 cent stores through their textures and colors. We were able to explore 99 cent iconography, we examine 99 cent stores and their aisles and the repetitive nature through printmaking. We also use 99 cent store objects to create a physical representation of the city's landscape. And through zine making, we're able to share the history of 99 cent stores and how communities have organized in response to them. And we also explored ideas of luxury and value. So through this exhibit, we were able to develop questions that are key to our inquiry-based work. How did a system or place come to be, and how do people and communities develop and react to them? Our newest prototype is reprojecting the community archive, a research and storytelling project. We love libraries, but we know that accessing archives can be challenging. Most of the history behind community planning is often remembered by community elders or relegated to academic archives and seldom incorporated into general education. We believe that it's possible to find new meanings and lessons from the archives. And you want to reproject history into the present day using storytelling and other modes of arts-based communication. We're interested in creating zines, exhibits, and collecting oral history, and all in the effort to make the archive visible through art. And we're looking for institutional and community partnerships to develop this work. We find a lot of inspiration from Sharas, AKA the Improbable Builders, Black Quantum Futurism, and The Illuminators. All of these projects make visible what is sometimes invisible or poorly understood.
So we don't work alone. We know that in this room and on this earth, there's millions of connected threads that nurture us. And we want to tap into that for our work. So here's our mycelium network, and we would love for you all to join us. So if you are a library or a museum that's interested in place-based history, we would love to talk. If you're a community organizer that has planning history that you want to share, please hit us up. If you're somebody that's generally interested in public education and want to talk about how we can use lessons to reach more expansive futures, please reach out. So to sum it up, we would love to thank and be curious with you. Thank, thank you. you. How's everyone doing? Good. <laughs> All right. Awesome. OK. Um, so my name's Johan Diedrich, and I've been playing with technology my whole life. Um, this is a photo of me from my local school newspaper growing up. Um, the quote says that I'm putting a program through its paces. I was in one of those gifted programs in elementary school, and so when educational software first came out, we were the first to try, and it made a huge impression on me. So it makes a bit of sense that I would continue to thread, um, or I would continue to thread this experimenting with technology for creative means throughout my life as a way to both express myself, connect with others, and be amazed at the world. I'm an artist, engineer, and programmer who makes installations, performances, sculptures, and open source hardware and software for experiencing the world through Sonic Encounter. I've always wanted to center the embodiedness of technology and move away from screens and office gestures, you know, click, drag, control copy, control paste. And instead, I wanted to highlight the fact that interacting with technology can be an activity brimming with expressive potential between people, their bodies, and the environment around them. So I created a sonic research and engineering studio called A Quiet Life, where I design and build audio-based software and hardware products for revealing new sonic possibilities off the grid. The first project from the studio is a musical instrument called The Harvester, an open platform for encountering new musical possibilities with yourself and others. It's in the form of a handheld synthesizer and sampler that you can customize to make music with everyday sounds. The Harvester allows you to record sounds and then it transposes that into a pentatonic scale, allowing you to play back that musical sound um, and within a rich palette of wild expressivity. Most importantly, the instrument is spatially aware, allowing the player to affect the sound by moving it uh, in three planes of axes. Here's a video of me musicking with a harvester out in the Everglades behind my home in South Florida. Important is the ability of the harvester to bring the best of digital technology to the outside world. No longer do we have to be confined to our studios or chained to a desk in order to leverage the advancements of digital music technology. We can reveal new sonic possibilities off the grid, both, the grid of, both resisting the grid of digital audio workstations and also the grid of conventional life, bringing digital electronic music to places and environments like never before. The Harvester is completely open source from the hardware down to the software, allowing for people of all abilities, skills, and backgrounds to customize the instrument to their own liking. Someone can buy a prefabricated instrument or dive into the deep end and build the instrument themselves or with others from the ground up 
learning the ins and outs of instrument tool making in the process. The vision of the Harvester is to provide an easy way for people to build, play, and interface with musical technology. The Harvester provides an accessible platform for a new generation of experimental sound makers that are underrepresented in and intimidated by musical technology. I want to help people develop a new relationship to playful musicking, one that incorporates our larger world and environment. Ultimately, I envision a world in which liberated access to creative expression leads to better well-being for people, society, and our planet. So how can you help? Um, as a harvester is a platform that I think of as a playground um, and a tool for play, I'm looking for playmates, which for me mean technologists, musicians, designers, hard and software engineers. I'm also looking for more formal um, creative partnerships with artists, musicians, and other types of creatives that want to work together with me on it as well as performance and exhibition opportunities and residencies and grants to help support the development of the harvester. And finally, your support with the purchase. This is the harvester as it exists today. Here's what the sounds I can do. And um, you can purchase a prefabricated version or if you want to get the parts, you can build it yourself. Um, you can reach out to me uh, via email or on Instagram and these are my websites. So thank you so much for listening. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Emmanuel Admasu. I'm an assistant professor at Columbia University GSAP, um, and I am a partner at ADWO in art and architecture practice. So it's been, it's been a pleasure working with these guys um, over the past year and just listening in on the process. So I just have um, a simple question kind of tied to um, our name. Uh, the name of our track is Collective abundance um, and all these projects obviously have nuanced and sophisticated ways of thinking about collective making um, so I just wanted to ask you know how your practices engage with this ethos uh, of collective abundance uh, but also uh, how are you considering and looking uh, to work with different forms of you know collective action conversation and visioning especially uh, as you continue to work within these cultural institutions that are obviously very much invested in multiple forms of individuation. <laughs> Y'all are on your own. <laughs> was that our softball question? <laughs> that was collective abundance, that's it. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll, I'll start. Um, no, what this uh, past you know, seven, eight months has really opened up and thinking about the next phase of, of my work is I have no intention of doing it on my own. And I've already started conversations with uh, communities and people way outside of art and the, you know, official art world. And it's been so enriching and enlivening. And, you know, I don't know where we're going to land yet, but it's, uh, I know it's a, a generative, um, process that will yield something that I never could have anticipated. I, I think um, I, I, I pause before answering that question because I think for the work that we've done, it's always been through the spirit of collectivity. That's how we became friends. That's how we've sort of moved in the world. And so I think that as we continue to move forward, it's trying to build the space where we can be learning together, build the space where we can be sharing knowledge. Um, I think there's something that happens when you go to school for a particular thing, you learn one way of doing things, you learn one mode of practice, and then the moment you leave grad school, you realize like, oh, there's a whole other world and there are a whole other people um, that have knowledges that I don't have or experiences that I don't have. And so I think that um, thinking about how this work moves forward, it's just thinking about ways to be open to 
different types of knowledges and different types of experiences, um, especially because of just you know the very formal training that Gloria and I both had. You you just sort of move in the world in a particular way, and unless you're intentional about sort of opening yourself up, it's easy to just sort of operate that way for the rest of your career. And so I think in this world of you know trying to dabble and bridge between art and you know collectivity and design and architecture and planning. Um, this this idea of collective is is really sort of the 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 theme that drives a lot of that. I don't know if you have. Uh, I just add a little thing. I think the two of us already talk a lot about also ownership because I think we come from views that when we do community engagement, we call it, I think sorry, but it's very extractive and using it for a certain mean. So how do we kind of when we think through interrogate the process of how do we get the story but make it to be not only about how we storytelling but also able to empower the people who are sharing the story with us. So definitely when we're looking through how we move in the future, that is something like we're thinking a lot about what that process could be to be more generative and expansive. Nice. Um, I'm thinking about this in the context of musical instruments and and electronic music and digital music instruments. And I think what I realized many years ago was how narrow the offerings were for expressing yourself th through music um, with the tools available to you. And then in some ways, ch making a choice of an instrument to use in this context would predetermine the kinds of music that you could make with it. And so I think abundance within the spirit of the harvester is to provide a platform that um, that kind of grows outward and has infinite potential, perhaps. Um, for me, as an, a musician and an artist and an engineer, and for others to also be able to come into that conversation and decide how they want the instrument to work for them or how they want it to exist in the world. So I think just you know, laying out there that there is there, there is an abundance of potential for musical expression, and um, what what we're what we're presented with is only a very narrow fraction of what's what's possible. Well, um, first of all, congrats to you guys. Um, it's been a privilege to work with you guys and in conversation over the past year. But I also want to give a shout out to the New Ink team that came up with the term uh, "collective abundance." So, congrats. <laughs> Wow, okay, so we're about halfway through our program and we're gonna take a break, but I just wanna make a special announcement before we do. Um, so with the support of Open Arts, New Inc. was able to provide a special grant opportunity to our current members and alumni. Uh, in February, we launched the next Web Seed Grant, a $10,000 grant to 10 New Inkers who are researching the potentials and models for a decentralized internet. The grant asked applicants to address the complex structural challenges of Web3, including fair governance, true shared power, tech access and literacy, environmental implications, NFT markets and cultural value, and artistic and design experimentation. So we received excellent, excellent ideas for projects that also expanded our definition of research, and today we're happy to share the recipients of the next WebSeed grant. So congratulations to Jaslyn, Bhavik Singh, Christopher Clary, Molly Soda, Rupa Vasudevan, Torin Blackensmith, Peter Whitten, Eliza Evans, Adele Lynn, Unnamed Fund, Yewen Song, Lisa Jamori, and Aaron Montoya Moraga. <laughs> Okay, so now I want to pass it to Tina Vass to tell us a little bit about Meta Open Arts. Hi, everyone. 
Thank you, Salome, for the introduction. On behalf of the Meta Open Arts team, many of whom are here today, I congratulate you, the New Inc. team, and the New Museum on an illuminating event today. At Meta Open Arts, we seek partners who are racing toward the horizon of how art and technology can help build a future with equity, equity, sustainability, and creativity at the foreground, which makes this demo day and this partnership with New Inc. so meaningful and so timely. A little background on Meta Open Arts. We are a global program that champions artists and builds community through creativity. We believe that making art and building technology are analogous forms of creative problem solving and that artists and technologists share a spirit of brave curiosity, unafraid to question things as they are, including the accepted absurd, as we've seen today, and to imagine new possibilities. Through partnerships such as this one with New Inc., as well as commissions and residencies, we provide resources to maximize creativity and bring people closer together. Our ever-expanding global network comprises more than 1,200 artists and designers, including many who are exploring emerging technologies such as blockchain, AR, VR, and AI. We provide funding, technological expertise, and creative opportunities to support the work of artists and organizations asking critical questions about the social issues of our time and of the future, which brings us to today's event. Thank you to all of the New Inc. artists and alumni who submitted a range of compelling proposals exploring the future of a decentralized web. From immersive art experiences to community-led tech innovation, you've shown us how we can shape a better Web3. I congratulate the 10 grant recipients here today. I also look forward to following the work of everyone who applied and to the possibility of working together in the future. We're living through a paradigm shift in the way the internet is structured which in turn promises to reshape our everyday lives. While a more immersive web brings new and expansive opportunities, it is not without its challenges. Now is the time to address issues of representation and access before inequitable structures become systemic. The work of everyone in this room can have a transformative effect on our collective futures, which makes this event so inspiring. Thank you again to New Inc. and to all of the artists and creative technologists here we're grateful to meet you here, which, as Cassie described, the intersection of art and technology. With that, I'll turn it back to Salome. Oh, there it goes. OK. Um, so that concludes the first half of this program, and now we're going to take a brief intermission, about 20 minutes, so let's return at 4.40 p.m.
Welcome back, everybody. Hope you had a nice break. <laughs> I'm Raven Ruffin. I'm the Program and Communications Manager here at New Inc. <laughs> Thank you. And I'm very excited to usher us into the next and final portion of today's program. Uh, so coming up next are members from our Extended Realities track. That includes Peter Burr, Adele Lynn, and Brandon Powers, and they will be joined by their mentor in residence, Winslow Porter. And then following, we'll have members from our Future Memory track. That is Rico Robo, Ariana Faye Allensworth, and Janelle Ambrose of Good Mirrors, and they will be joined by their mentor in residence, Emma Osor. So please welcome Peter Burr. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome back. My name is Peter Burr, and I'm an artist working with computers. <laughs> it all started about 30 years ago for me when I played this uh, video game called Mac Paint that we see up here that was probably secretly training me to be a visual artist. It sparked my interest in painting, which led me to exploring animation, installation, and making my own video games. A few years ago, I fired up an emulator and started playing with Mac Paint again, which we see here. It was exactly as I remembered working with this tool and the constraints of this program that was built in 1984. And within those constraints, I found something really interesting. Despite the very limited color palette, the lack of an asset store, the super simple interface, I found a voice to talk about some really complex feelings around this current moment using a tool that was really, really long ago left behind. And I think that the fact that this tool was so straightforward and familiar was something that actually helped me to discover that voice. I think about this discovery a lot today because these days we're in this world where technology and these advancements of technology cycle faster than our minds and our bodies can comprehend. As soon as a website or software interface becomes familiar, I expect that it's going to change. A system of updates, whether or not we like it. And I don't really see this stopping. In this world of update hell, I wonder if any of us ever will catch up. I don't think any of you all know. I certainly don't know. But perhaps the more appropriate question here is, how do we actually build a better world from systems that change before we ever even learn to deal with their shortcomings? This technology speed death is a phenomenon that I experience moving so quickly that anything that I propose here for you all today will only get buried in a new problem tomorrow. You guys feel that? Like, what is this term web 3.0. <laughs> is it some sort of internet that's more immersive? Is it more decentralized? Is it more metaversy? I'm personally struck by how few definition, how very few of these definitions have made any sense to me. And I'm an artist who makes work for, in, and about the internet. What is Web 3.0? Is it a future that prefaces followers over collaboration, fair use, or artistic integrity? Is it a way to make building a new website more environmentally destructive? Is it venture capitalist FOMO pushing users towards monetization tools that definitely don't work? These are obviously really pessimistic examples, and I'll leave that pessimism aside because I actually see this vagueness of Web 3.0 as a positive thing. It means that we're still in a space where we actually do get to invent this future. Maybe Web 3 could be a space where we could actually build a labor union so that people could share in the excesses of this automated future that's coming. Can we imagine a way for the secondary sales of an NFT artwork to support the artist just as much as a speculator who's flipping it on that secondary market? I know I would definitely like to imagine that. But again, I keep coming back to this baseline question of how do we actually build a better, more generous world from systems that change before we actually learn to work around their shortcomings? 
As an artist, my recent work has been centering around this question. For instance, a few years ago, I built a computer simulation of this underground smart building called Dirt Scraper and invited audiences to come inside to bear witness to this model civilization. In this fully automated future, technology decays like everything else, and we get to spend time with Dirt Scraper's virtual community who tell us about their home and attempt to quell the anxious noise of their reality. Sound familiar to anybody? Or this project that I'm currently developing with Mark Fingerhut called Triumphs, which is a suite of computer software sold in an NFT marketplace. Each artwork uses real malware techniques to take over the user's desktop temporarily. While the function of this artwork's programming is actually benevolent, I'm hoping that it'll trigger an audience's a sense that the well-being of their computer and by proxy, their increasingly computerized identity is at stake. I present artworks like this as illustrations of the tensions that I'm interested in surfacing so that we can consider alternatives to things that are maybe not working so well for us right now. I believe that collectively we can responsibly and ethically move into this era of Web 3.0 together, knowing that we're not recreating the systems of the past that have historically oppressed most of us. But it's definitely, definitely not going to happen on its own. I want you all here to sit with me in this dream space of what an ethical internet system looks like today, given that inequities are present even in systems that we already kind of understand ones that are existing already. If you are in this audience and you think of yourself as a stakeholder in this new future of Web 3.0, let's talk about what tensions you are feeling in this space and how you might actually see these tensions easing. I'll be around after this show. Uh, I'm also on the internet, you can write me here. Let's do something. I want to thank New Inc. for giving me the opportunity to share this work and these ideas with you all. New Museum, thank you for hosting, and all of you, thank you guys for being here. Good afternoon. My name is Adele, and today I'm inviting you to come on a short journey with me. My work as an artist is shaped by being an outsider to many systems. I've been an immigrant twice and a minority working in tech. I've often worked for other artists too. For example, on teams building wearables that show what is going on inside the body, and building software which is used to create light-filled urban interiors. These perspectives of being an outsider, yet instinctively collaborative, inform my wider practice, which is about harnessing the power of technology to create community, social consciousness, and awareness of the worlds that we occupy. Sometimes my approach means imbuing physical objects with new powers to create magical, healing, and change-making experiences. I create mythologies and worlds that question and celebrate our collective humanity. It is when the audience puts their trust in me, embodying these works, does it come to life, and the meaning and power of the experience is fully articulated. Let me give you an example. During the height of the pandemic and the Black Lives Matter movement in 2020, we were learning that to stay silent was to be complicit in the structures built to oppress. Indoors and isolated, I turned to a game, Animal Crossing, maybe you know it, that engaged many of us at the time. Within the game, I built a memorial for lives who were lost, which then turned into a protest route and a fundraiser. Together, we raised $11,000 whilst giving access to those isolated in quarantine who were too young to protest or were overseas, providing a novel way for them to show up in solidarity. Now, I'd like to introduce you to two projects. The first one I'll speak to more briefly with an invitation to gather and experience this in person. It's called Starcatcher. Starcatcher is about the Bond experience gazing into a star-filled sky as a group. 
As I was developing this, the billionaire space race filled the news cycle, espousing how this techno-utopia and stellar mining were going to solve our resource problems. And I had a troubling thought. Does Starcatcher make com people complicit in this fantasy? So in this immersive game, the audience is both protagonist and performer, catching stars as they fall, experiencing how we are sharing human experiences under the same skies. The audience is also invited to contemplate this exploitation model of space and how our actions affect the ecology of the worlds that we are in. Starcatcher will be playable at Onyx Studio in June. And eventually, I would love to have 100 people sharing under the skies together, playing, catching stars under the skies together. The next project, Tony, is about intimacy, kinship, and empowerment. In 2016, I made a set of amulets reflecting the strength and bonds I experienced running a nonprofit. Amulets are often imbued with magical powers and are symbols of aid and protection. These amulets incorporate augmented reality extensions giving them their own powers of protection. Tony is informed by this crafting process. Now, Tony began with a specific question. What does it mean to use sister as a verb? These teachings of Tony K. Bambara conjure a powerful concept, that different relationships, regardless of gender, cultural background, and race, are premises for sistering. Reflecting on the trauma I experienced in the finance and tech industries, I realized that what helped me survive were the many acts of sistering that I experienced. I learned that it was just as important to advocate for others, to hold space, to share knowledge and credit those around us, making sure they are seen. This applies to my female, trans, non-binary, and especially male counterparts. These acts, although gentle, are acts of strength. They are multiplicative, empowering many and not just one. What types of sistering are present in your life? To honor the multitude of relationships, Tony enacts a ritual of co-creation. This can be a one-to-one -one experience where we create amulets to be gifted, or a group experience where we, work to, where we work together towards creating an amulet that represents our shared values. Each amulet begins with a survey I developed asking questions about a relationship of empowerment. Traits and elements within the stories then inform the design and design of amulets and augmentations. The amulets can be worn or displayed as sculptural objects. To uncover with the power within these amulets, hold your smartphone up to it to see them mapped onto the person who wears it. This creates a larger than life avatar that the wearer can embody, serving as a reminder of our powers in times of adversity. Systems are flawed everywhere because systems are designed by humans and people are flawed. However, I believe that humans can be united by beauty and compassion, and therefore it is important to build worlds that include all of us, to inspire people to be the best versions of themselves as we are collectively accountable to future generations. So let's build worlds together, both the one we collectively share and the ones we imagine through creative acts. I'm interested in working with people and organizations that foster kinship and supportive relationships, and venues to allow people to inhabit the universes of Starcatcher and Tony. In your takeaway bags later, you will find a sticker and an amulet. Please put the amulet on. Use the instructions on the website to engage them with your mobile devices. And um, let's have a conversation after. Thank you. I believe in a future with a more embodied relationship to technology. A future filled with experiences that move us through space, feeling good. I believe in a future where artists are not reduced to content creators, but instead are championed as culture changers, advocates, and bridge builders. Well, how did I come to believe in this future? My background comes from a confluence in theater, dance, and technology. Devised theater, immersive theater, and musical theater, fusing together with contemporary dance, hip hop, and classical modern, and adding in a passion for technology and how it can enrich our lives. With this history, I find myself sitting at the intersection of many different conversations, 
in many different disciplines and collaborators. That's why, besides just referring to myself as a creative director, a choreographer, or producer, at the end of the day, I'm a translator. I'm someone who bridges the gap between artists and technologists so we can understand each other and therefore how to build the best future together. I aim to illuminate how technology can supercharge our creative practices and how our creative practices can unlock key challenges and injustices we see in technology. Without this bridge, we make bad design decisions that harm us. And as we accelerate towards a world with a spatial internet, with technology surrounding us, these bad interactions and decisions are gonna find themselves on our bodies as well, imprinting harmful embodied memories and knowledge. And this is already happening and affects our physical world <laughs> due to the growing increase of augmented reality and immersive experiences. A Pokemon appearing in Pokemon Go, arguably the world's most popular AR game, can incite a massive stampede. Meanwhile, in virtual reality, we're often asked to slash our arms and move vigorously, but creators are neglecting to think about how the movement of our body actually makes us feel. An immersive interaction incites movement. This movement is choreography and requires a new approach to design. These challenges, combined with my background, has led me to create embodiment design. A design methodology combining choreographic and user experience practices to create more grounded, human, and embodied experiences. So, how do we do this? Embodiment design invites us to think from the inside out. We first design how we want our visitors to uh, feel using Laban movement analysis, a choreographic system that's been around for decades to find the right movement and gestures. And then we build the virtual world around them. This approach is the cornerstone methodology of my experiential studio, Constellation. Constellation creates multi-platform, cross-disciplinary experiences that think boldly and inclusively with the human at the center. One such experience is Duet, which had a work in progress showing at New York Live Arts in January. Duet is a movement ritual for virtual reality, transforming who and what VR and dance are for. Two participants adorn VR headsets and are guided by music and light to dance together while an audience watches on. In this excerpt of the beginning of the experience, you see how embodiment design helped us create unique gestures and movements which ground our participants. We're able to transform human movement through space and think ambitiously and holistically about how VR both feels to experience and watch from the outside. If you'd like to experience Duet, please reach out and we can arrange for you to come visit me at my studio. While Duet is a movement-based experience, Constellation can help your team create and support a wide range of experiences with our philosophy, like this immersive audio journey for the Ace Hotel, or leading workshops for theater makers for Magic Leap, or creating an innovative transmedia experience at The Shed. The way your audience moves shouldn't come last. It should come first. And so I ideally come in early in the process so we can understand how your audience wants to move through space, whether it's physical or virtual. We could be collaborating on a theme park layout, museum exhibit, or XR experience, just to name a few examples. So let's have a conversation to build the embodied future together. We can if we just think from the inside out. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. It's been a while since I've been at this podium. Um, so my name is Winslow Porter. I'm a director, producer, and creative technologist. I'm one of the founders of New Reality Company and a co-creator of Tree and Giant, which we actually made next door back in the second and third cohort here at New Inc. So it's amazing to see everything that's happened since then, um, how it's expanded, and how all these amazing ideas have come to life. 
So it's tr truly an honor to be able to work with you guys. Um, also, I'm a member of Onyx, uh, which Adele mentioned. We're actually going to be having a, a showcase, which is happening uh, on June 9th to the 12th, where all their projects will be, uh, will be showing, as well as everyone else, the seven other members of the cohort. So I strongly rec uh, recommend you guys check that out. And with, um, with my questions, it seems like a lot of you guys have been, uh, there's a lot of talk about the tools that are being used and also, you know, what harm they can do and what good they can do. So I guess just thinking about that, in the next few years, what are your hopes and fears about how these emerging technologies or tools can empower the audience first, make them complicit to the systems that they elucidate uh, or break down? That's a great question. <laughs> Should we start with the hopes or the fears? That's up to you. Um, well, I mean, I, so I have an art background, and I feel like it's been really recent that I've uh, been introduced to this idea of design affordances or the way that an object or a software interface kind of suggests a way that it should be used. So I think about like that door where we come in and out. Um, if that door has like a pull handle, but you have to push it, it, make, it, it's a badly designed door. It makes you kind of feel stupid, right? There's a way that it's suggesting that you want to use it, but then it's, but then it's, it's supposed to be used another way. And so I suppose one of the fears that I have and that I, I certainly see pervading, I mean, I've just talked about Web 3.0 for five minutes, and some of my personal anxieties around that is that there's a lot of this narrative of being like, oh, this is a push door, but we're being shown a pull handle. And so... Um, I don't know what to do with that. And I think as an artist, like I'm not pretending to be a designer. I'm here in some ways to kind of problematize this. It's like, can we can we just talk about the fact that this is this is happening and then perhaps collectively uh, come up with some sort of alternative? Um, who knows what that is? Uh, I, I think personally it's more interesting to come up with those ideas together and to kind of play through what a, a better uh, kind of tool might actually be. Right? I think that... that like these aesthetic forms or these ways that things look can't be divorced from the social formations around them. And so that feels like a really important way of thinking about what a better future might actually be. Awesome, thank you so much. Who's next, Adele? Yeah, thanks Peter, and uh, thanks for your, your talk. Uh, that was definitely- Thank you for your talk. Uh, <laughs> Brandon, thanks for your talk. Thanks. We love it. We love each other. <laughs> Um, you know, in a way, I don't feel like this is anything new. Um, kind of having been on the outside of so many doors, knocking, trying to get in, um, both from te a technology perspective, from um, government infrastructural perspective, there are just, um, it's just another it's just another element in an ongoing set of oppressions. And for me, my life's work, practice, has been about figuring out these systems, getting into these rooms, and then trying to hold the door open. And so I really appreciate New Inc. and Meta for now giving me this opportunity to continue to do that, to continue to ask questions, to interrogate these systems, to understand them from the inside out, and then use them to create joyful, inclusive experiences that are whimsical, and take ownership of these technologies and build something for us. Um, so those are my <laughs> hopes and fears and, and what drives me to, to continue to do this every day. So. Thank Absolutely, you. and I want, I want to build off that, Adele. It's, it's 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 totally on point, and I think this question is, I think, the essential challenge and question of this like XR moment um, and this like metaverse moment, right? And both go back and forth constantly if you're creating in this field. And I think that simultaneously, I have this feeling of, hey, like we're on the precipice of, in my opinion, creating a world that's gonna change how we all just interact as humans, right? And so there's this amazing hope and feeling, especially as coming, someone coming from theater and dance, which is like an ancient form, right? I'm used to like, it's been around for centuries and here I am bringing my perspective to it as a new artist. Here's an opportunity for me to say, hey, we can actually build this new form together 
from the ground up. It doesn't exist yet. So that's extremely exciting to me. And I think it's really important with that in mind to then be calling all the folks into the room because otherwise we will, as a society, make the same mistakes we make over and over and over again about excluding people from those rooms. And in this, op in this space of XR, I think we need to think even more expansively about who should be in those rooms um, and the idea of demographic you know, extending to uh, like discipline, right? And that you know, there are folks that, that, that's why I'm so passionate about you know, working with theater makers and dance makers because we actually have a lot to bring to this space even if you've never coded once in your life. Uh, just in the way that architects are really important in this space. And so that's where this idea of um, hope you know, comes in. And I think the only fear is when companies don't listen to us <laughs> um, or our folks are pushing against that. Because the community itself, and I think you're seeing that really beautifully today with new, our cohort and with New Inc., we believe in it. We're here to step up to the plate. So we just want to welcome other folks to come in and say, yeah, let's do it. You know? Awesome. Thank you so much. Also, I got, I got goosebumps, I'm not going to lie, uh, seeing how you guys were able to take your answers and add to each one, and it was really amazing. So really honored to be able to work with you all. And, and thank you, so Winslow. For your presentation. Thank, you. thank you so much. Thank you. And please come out to the XR Showcase at Onyx, uh, I believe June 8th to, to the 11th. Thank you. Hey everyone, what's up? I'm Itzel Basualdo. And I'm Daniel Almeida. Thanks for joining us today. Both Daniel and I are Latine culture workers and we are here to talk to you about Rico Robo. But before we get into the nitty gritty of Rico Robo, <laughs> it is also important that you understand where we come from. I am originally from Caracas, Venezuela, but moved to Miami in 2011 when I was 18. And just last year, I was granted a temporary protected status that allows me to remain in the country. And I was born in Miami, but to answer the where are you really from question, I am half Mexican and half Argentinian. My parents left their home countries in the early 1980s due to deep socioeconomic unrest that plagued the region. And that's kind of like the running story here in Rico Robo. None of us are really from here. And despite our vastly different life experiences navigating the world as both artists and people, we're often confronted with a similar monolith surrounding our identities and a general disconnect with our histories and culture. During the pandemic, we came together through online social gatherings from New York to Miami to Kansas City to Lima. And we are artists, we are researchers, we're photographers, we're scholars, we're designers, we're curators, we're pretty much anything you want us to be. <laughs> And along Itzel, uh, Rodrigo, Olenka, and Adrián, we form a five-member organization with a horizontal leadership structure called the Research Institute on Cannibal Opportunism Repository of Obsessive <laughs> Revolutionary Obsolescence. All of that really means <laughs> that we are a borderless production lab focused on decommodifying Latina narratives. We use humor and cross-disciplinary tactics, including site-specific activations and communal archiving to put transgressive out transgressive knowledge out into the world for more <laughs> equitable futures. And we've divided the scope of our research into five meridians, which are oral, audiovisual, text, material, and graphic. Each of them reflecting our uh, different areas of expertise surveying current and historical uh, cultural production in the region. We're drawing on sources that range from political movements to propaganda to pop culture to the similarities and differences that made up our lives. So the practical application of our ideas looks like, or better sounds like, or triple R, or Rico Robo in residence, which seeks to create opportunities for engagement with critical lesser told histories through site-specific activations. Our goal here, and really the objective of Rico Robo, is to transgress conventional Latina narratives by putting together anti-colonial programming, providing a space to speculate, unlearn, learn, and heal, and engaging with young audiences like children and teens. Later this year in Doral, a relatively new city in Northwest Miami-Dade County. This activation will be hosted by DORCAM, a local organization dedicated to promoting the arts in Doral. Doral is not only close to home for both Isel and I, 
But as you can see on the map, it is also far removed from the cultural hub in Miami, which is 50 miles away. Using both personal, fuel, and archival research, our, our project in Doral will consist of a plaza party, an interactive exhibition with accompanying K-12 curricula, and a bootleg archive workshop. With the plaza party, we seek to create liminal spaces to exist outside of monetization. Spaces for play, rest, leisure, spaces to simply exist. The plaza party presents an opportunity to engage with the idea of rest and play as resistance. The exhibition, Retail Space Takeover, will function as a point of contact, a surprise, a place to engage with transgressive material, where the accessibility and criticality of art is valued over its transactional potential. We also want the exhibition side uh, to welcome school groups to engage with our ideas, but we're also building a company in curricula for, for local educators to bring these conversations back into the classroom. Finally, the bootleg archival workshop allows us to co-create with the community an archive of bootleg toys, introducing youth and other audiences to open source values and fabrication processes. So Daniel, what are we, what are we looking for here? Well, this year we're looking for local for organizations, for partnering organizations who want to invest in socially engaged projects like Triple Art. And also, we are looking for funding to support our continued research on intimate Latina histories, narratives, and futures. But you can also just hit us up. We are open to conversations, collaborations, friends, and uncanny situations. <laughs> Thank you so much. It has been very real. Hope to see you later at the reception. Hi everyone, my name is Ariana Faye Allensworth. I'm an artist, researcher, and cultural strategist. I've spent the past 10 years producing place-based storytelling projects that explore marginalized histories and amplify hidden narratives through community-engaged research and photography. As a longtime member of the collective Anti-Eviction Mapping Project, I've produced maps and technology projects that seek to embolden housing justice movements. My ongoing project, Staying Power, is a print and online publishing platform that seeks to amplify a people's history of public housing. And in addition to those things, I'm also a descendant of the founder of Allensworth, California, a small town in the southern reaches of California's Central Valley on the unceded ancestral land of the Yakut people that was once home to a thriving free black agricultural community in the early 20th century. And today I'm gonna to ask for your support in ensuring that Allensworth's history and future is protected and shared. The town was founded in 1908 as a symbol of black self-determination and prosperity in the West by my uncle, Alan Allensworth. He was among the tens of thousands of formerly enslaved black people that founded self-governing black communities in the 19th and 20th century. After the town was founded, it thrived for nearly a decade but began to decline due to a host of reasons, including severe drought, the untimely death of Alan Allensworth, and a series of racist and hostile attacks by a neighboring white community. My father, Charles Allensworth, learned about the town of Allensworth in 1976, when a registrar at the City College of San Francisco noticed he shared the same last name as the town. Up until that moment, he nor any of our extended family had any knowledge of the town or our ancestral connection to it. This slide coalesces clippings from my dad's extensive genealogical research, repairing this rupture in our family memory. It was also around that time that Allensworth descendants, residents, and neighbors banded together to save the town from demolition by petitioning the state of California to preserve it as a historic site. The land was purchased by the California State Parks and Allensworth State Historic Park was born in 1976. Allensworth is often referred to by locals as the town that refused to die. And over the course of several decades, 21 of the town's original buildings have been restored and reconstructed so that the dreams of Allensworth's visionary pioneers can live on for generations to come. The story of this grassroots effort to preserve Alan Allensworth's dreams and my own father's parallel journey to reclaim this gap in our collective family memory has informed many of my creative and activist commitments to spatial and racial justice. 
And now it's my turn to carry on their efforts to ensure that this history is protected and shared. And that's why I'm creating Mapping Allensworth, a creative technology and public art project that seeks to bring the history of Allensworth, California to broader audiences. One of the greatest threats to this community is that its history continues to not be widely known and stronger support is needed to support Allensworth State Historic Park and the surrounding town. A new generation of leaders hopes to restore Allensworth, which is now home to a mainly migrant farm worker community and a handful of black residents who are fighting to revitalize the economic health and vitality of the town and surrounding um, state park. This project seeks to embolden those efforts by educating, enlightening, and engaging broader publics with Allensworth's history. There's a living history in Allensworth, and I plan to partner with Allensworth residents, neighbors, and historians to spatialize community memory of Allensworth across time, co-designing a platform that uses data visualization, spatial mapping, and 3D rendering to explore the history of Allensworth and present-day struggles for the town's vitality. The platform allows visitors to engage with the history of the site from anywhere through virtual tours and interactive content. A public art campaign will enable the project to have a life offline as well by activating billboards and public spaces throughout the state that feature imagery from Mapping Allensworth's digital platform and bringing broader public awareness to the existence of the town and the uh, history of the project. The ways that Allensworth pioneers imagined and practiced a world outside of the world that denies black humanity hold enduring lessons today as we address ongoing struggles for racial housing and economic justice. This project seeks to storytell around the geographies of black liberation within Allensworth's past, present, and future. I need your help in ensuring that this history is uplifted and shared. I need involvement from a creative technology partner who specializes in spatial mapping and 3D rendering. I'm also interested in financing for the research, development, and production of Mapping Allensworth, and I'm seeking grants and philanthropic partners who can fund my vision for the project. And finally, I invite every listener to find an opportunity to spark a conversation with someone in their community about the Allensworth story, just like that community college registrar did for my dad in 1976. This history will live on in the stories we tell about it. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> it is quite an honor to be here with you today. I am Janelle Ambrose. I'm a storyteller, first generation American, a mom, and the founder of Good Mirrors. During my time at New Wink, I've been interrogating memory and the role that technology plays in preserving and sharing the narratives of black women. As part of my research, I asked Alexa to tell me what she knows about black women and this was her response. Alexa, tell me about black women. The term black women describes a woman of African descent. Black women have been seen in stereotypical ways which result in increased health risks for them. Not only are they at a higher risk to contract these diseases than white women, but they also are at a higher risk to die from them as well. Black slaves, many of whom were women, were often abused by their owners and other white people. This abuse extended beyond the physical and psychological abuse directly related to how slaves were treated, and include the exploitation of black women slaves in order to advance different scientific practices and techniques. Would you like me to continue? What impact do the stories we are told about ourselves have on our identity and self-determination? Imagine if your story was decided for you. Would your life journey have been the same? Warped representations of the 22 million black women in the United States and millions more around the world has limited our ability to see who we are and who we can be. I established Good Mirrors to disrupt this narrative. We are a cultural institute committed to accurately reflecting black women as whole and dignified beings. Our name is inspired by a poem by Audre Lorde called Good Mirrors Are Not Cheap. In the poem, 
Audrey describes how the status quo creates gross misrepresentations of historically marginalized people. At Good Mirrors, we believe it is up to us to create our own images and our own mirrors. Our three pillars are designed to impact culture, education, and technology with a singular mission to undo the harm of racial and gender stigmas. Our multidisciplinary studio is dedicated to impacting culture. We co-create content and social impact initiatives with like-minded partners to effectively, credibly, and consistently amplify the voices of black women at scale. Last year, we collaborated with Unilever's Shea Moisture to grant $50,000 to black women artists around the country. We also established an in-house creative agency and provided commercial opportunities for the grant winners. Sunday School is our experimental creative arts program that utilizes storytelling as a pathway to help black women unlearn and heal from the harmful impact of their daily experiences. We host cross-generational conversations and workshops on and offline throughout the year. Truth is our interactive digital universe that collects and transmits stories of black women by black women to combat the systemic bias embedded in AI-powered systems. Today, I'd like to draw your attention to this aspect of Good Mirrors and the safe space that we are building online for black women and girls. Truth will be a living archive, sanctuary, and source of black feminist consciousness co-created by black women and girls for black women and girls. And it will leverage AI to surface a greater quantity and quality of stories of black women and girls online. I'm so proud to share that we are recent recipients of the Mozilla Creative Media Award in support of this project. And Stephanie Dinkins has joined as a mentor advisor. We will launch Truth publicly later this summer with the pop-up Memory Lab. It will serve as a makerspace and audiovisual studio. We'll invite black women and girls to share their stories and creative expressions as artifacts for truth. We are seeking support to bring, up the, to bring the pop-up memory lab to life. We are in need of space and equipment. The Mozilla grant will cover the machine learning research for the platform, and we are seeking additional monetary funding to close the gap, to hire collaborators, to commission artists, and facilitate workshops, and so much more. We are working toward an ambition of securing a permanent physical space, one that will be a cultural center and landmark to the achievements and stories of black women. I'm super eager to chat with folks who have either built or invested in new institutions and can see the vision of this work in the long term. This work is deeply personal for me. Growing up, I was not aware of the stories of black women that would have affirmed my identity. As a mom to three girls, there was an urgency for me to shape the world that they grow up in. The impact of truth is immeasurable in securing a future where the wholeness and dignity of black women and girls are realized. Striving to uplift and honor the brilliance of black women has allowed me to find my voice. Will you support in helping other black women and girls find their voices? I am Janelle Ambrose, the founder of Good Mirrors. Thank you. Hey, hey, woman, whole world trying to bring me down. Let me get to the background until you got to stand on. OMG, so much power. I'm like, uh, I'm like very overwhelmed right now. Um, my name is Emma Osore. Uh, I use she, her, and hers pronouns. I'm one of the founding members of Black Space, which is, woo, yeah, <laughs> which is a black urbanist collective, an accelerator, uh, nationally organizing black civic designers and matching them with work in historically black communities. Um, and honestly, I was kind of scared and intimidated to be the mentor in residence for this track because you can see the brilliance that is a part, this is a fraction of the brilliance that has been a part of the track. 
Um, and so as more of a peer, I would say, than a mentor exploring these ideas, um, we've explored what it looks like to play with, to destabilize, and honor the truth of our communities and ourselves. Um, and from these year-long, almost a year-long exchanges, um, I'm, I'm sort of able to eke out and visualize like a view of future memory infrastructure that uh, moves kind of public monuments to the side and through you all's work can just picture the space for like a livable, breathable cultural ecosystem that um, is really embodied. And so we also kind of looked at in this track that the possibilities in digital space uh, open up a world uh, where we might be able to finally and expansively tell our full stories. And so kind of with that, um, I wondered how you all see the future of our stories being shared um, online or in physical space, um, and specifically what you see in each other, uh, in each other's work. That's me. Hi. <laughs> um, I think just reflecting on all of our projects, I see a lot of joy, um, abundance. I also see audacity. Um, to thrive and exist in a society that doesn't want people like us up here to, to do so. Um. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I think what I see in these folks' work is a lot around uh, kind of creating infrastructure for our communities to like champion our own representation um, and also having more expansive invitations or calls into community. So often, I think in like both of y'all's work, you're thinking a lot about the ways we're often called into community around our suffering or around our marginalization. And I think y'all are finding ways to, to build and cohere space um, from a space of like joy and, and being able to define, be defined beyond our marginalization. I think that in a way it's uh... Interesting how, like, for example, like the way that we came together, like Rico Robo, it came up out of, as we were saying about, like, uh, in the pandemic, you know, we were isolated and we got online. Uh, there was, like, these talks happening in Argentina, and I started going there, and I started feeling how, like, my work and the conversations that I was interested had a different sound when talking with people, like, you know, that come from a background similar to mine or look like me. Um, and I think it's interesting to then, like, think about how this is not a, a job that you do like solo, you do collectively. And I feel like with Rico Roa and what I see in, in your, both of your works is like also like this idea of creating a space for people to join in and you know, like draw these stories together. So that's kind of like what I see that we have in common. I, I thought the question was to look into each other's eyes and say what we see, you know, like in their pro I was I was ready to like look, you know, I'm it's like, selling the shit. Um, but I think that in all of our projects, I see, I, I see hope, no, um, care and wanting, yeah, creating a culture of care and empathy, um, where I think we we want to build those spaces, make those spaces for each other and for our communities. Yeah. You're right. That was the question. So now you can look into each other's <laughs> eyes. Lovingly, endearingly, breathe life into each other as we go on to the next part of our program. Thank you so much, Emma, for Thank everything. you, Emma. Testing? Okay. Can we have a round of applause for our speakers? <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm going to introduce our, our closing speaker, but I just want to say I don't think there are words to thank you all for all of the hard work that you've put in. Um, it has been 
a long five, six months. Um, and so just congratulations, and I'm very proud of all of you today. You were amazing. Um, to introduce our next speaker, I'm very honored to uh, announce that we have American artists with us today. They were invited as a witness uh, to, to, to all the beautiful and brilliant ideas that were put forth today. And just to offer a quick bio, um, since so many words were shared, let's see here. American artist makes thought experiments that mine history of technology, race, and knowledge production, beginning with their legal name change in 2013. Their artwork primarily takes the form of sculpture and software and video. So we are very excited to have their interrogations and thoughts with us today. Welcome. <laughs> Hello. I thought I would have enough hands, but I will have to stand here so I can have my phone on the podium. Um, I just want to say, first of all, thank you for inviting me. Um, I've been extremely, extremely impressed with everything that was shared today and seeing resonances with, you know, work that I'm also doing um, has made it easier to kind of speak to how I see the impact of these projects in the world, and it's very exciting. Um, I also wanted to say I have been co-teaching a class with Salome for a while um, in design technology at Parsons, and we always have student presentations and they never finish on time. They notoriously <laughs> always take too long. So I was very impressed with how how y'all stayed on schedule. Everyone took exactly five minutes. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, also, I've been kind of taking notes throughout, and I feel like it's more than 15 minutes. But when I'm nervous, I tend to talk faster. So maybe it'll be exactly 15 minutes. Um, so I was asked to be a witness. and. I think that's an interesting terminology to think about what witnessing means um, and how that can be used to make decisions on people's livelihoods um, in cases where people are witnessing, you know, doing certain activities that can be interpreted in various ways. So that's kind of how I, I think about witnessing and thinking about it in relationship to surveillance. Um, and a lot of my practice deals with surveillance and often citing the work of Simone Brown, who writes about ra racism and surveillance, and particularly uh, surveillance in relationship to um, being black. And um, that also got me thinking about this notion of how the body can become data, um, which Carrie talked about. And so thinking about the act of witnessing and also the act of you know, someone's um, identity or aspects of their body becoming data and that being used in various ways. Um, so all that to say that to witness is a privilege and it comes with a lot of power. And so it's cool to be able to be in this position, um, but also um, to think about, you know, what is that responsibility of witnessing? Um, and it also got me thinking about this question that Janelle asked and I'm, um, this, I may not be quoting exactly, but what impact do the stories we are told about ourselves have on us? And that is also related to witnessing. So I hope that this reflection of all of your presentations is a validate, validating witnessing. So that was supposed to be there. <laughs> um, so, this is just a, a map of California that I found that kind of um, shows all of the missions that were, you know, colonizing California. Um, I often think about this when I'm teaching about the history of settler colonialism in California and how that kind of led to what is today Silicon Valley. So thinking about technology through this lens of what came prior. Um, and also because I'm from California and I you know, was taught the history of missions in, you know, elementary school and just I've been thinking more and more about what it means to be from there and how that's informed my 
understanding of the world and um, how much I can't escape the history of the place that I'm from. Um, which brings me to this, this idea I liked um, that Laudi Kolab described as a place-based history, um, which is very much how I think about place um, as something that is intrinsic to who I am, whether I like it or not. And so, you know, interrogating that and, and thinking about that is really important to me. And I think along the same lines of kind of thinking of how this history has informed technology, um, I think about what is um, anti-colonial work, which Rico Robo um, talked about. Um, what does it mean to kind of think about a way of, I don't know, acknowledging or, or working against, you know, this history that's been bestowed on us? Um, additionally, what does it mean to own land? Um, and thinking about Eliza's notion of mineral rights, um, what does it mean that privatization and property was imposed on the land that we stand on now? And lastly, when I see a map of California, I think about black migration and, and black ownership, um, which Ariana's project addresses, and, and thinking about what it means for, you know, my family members to have moved there, um, you know, long ago in the face of racial terror that was going on throughout the nation and why people moved um, at various points in history. So this slide, I don't know how many of you are familiar with this image, but um, this is from the what is known as the mother of all demos, um, which took place in 1968. Um, and this was something that took place at Stanford U University, which was like this guy, uh, Doug Engelbart, who invented the computer mouse, but he also kind of debuted um, this first like clickable interface. Um, and this uh, event has kind of been something that informed my understanding in, you know, critiquing what is a computer interface and what are the values that are kind of embedded in it. Um, and I put this slide in here without making the connection to the fact that this is demo day, so it's actually perfect. Um, so where does this idea about demo come from? Um, this was a demonstration of this new technology to kind of show the world what was to come. Um, and that kind of laid a precedent for what demos in technology space, you know, look like from then onward. And interestingly enough, when you hear demo day, you also think of demolition day. So what else can demo mean? And I think of demolition as being the sort of what needs to happen before we can bring about the beautiful new reality um, that many of y'all have described. And so to that, I say the point of a demo is to show why resources need to be given. And you should give these people resources that they very clearly <laughs> um, explained what they need. So please. So from that um, demo, I made this sculpture, which is also called Mother of All Demos. And it's this computer that's made of dirt, but it's, it's functioning still. And kind of to show um, what are alternative values to what we sort of see in a lot of high technology. Um, what is a computer that looks like it doesn't want to be touched, but it's actually, you know, still functioning. Um, and also, addressing this idea of, of slowness that Rupa mentioned. Um, what does it mean that technology moves too fast? You know, what does it mean for a computer that actually embraces slowness? Um, I also thought of this hearing Peter's presentation. Um, this, the speed of change within technology, it's constantly making itself obsolete. And so that was something that I also wanted to challenge. Um, more recently, I created this work, which is a neon of the circuit, um, which may be familiar to some of you, but this is a master-slave flip-flop. That's what it's called. That's how you learn about it in engineering school, as far as I know. Um, it's still called that. And I wanted to kind of highlight this to think about how 
um, these different power dynamics are embedded in the technologies and have always been. And, and how, as much as we can use these tools and, and do different things with them, we have to sort of understand where they came from and the ideologies that were in them at that moment. And so that makes me think about, you know, what it means to make new tools um, and use those to also shape the reality that we want. So thinking about Johann's Harvester, what does it mean to take um, this technical device and make sound, you know, extracting from nature and making something um, that we want to see and hear. And I think similarly about um, Brandon's use of um, technology to think about what it means to move in ways that we want and how does that make us feel. So recently I was asked to engage the metaverse and I have been a skeptic for for quite a while, two years is that I've known about it. Um, <laughs> and um, yeah, I, I did this project for this place, Epoch Gallery, which is um, an online art space where they create an entire like uh, 3D virtual space and the artists put objects in it. And they created this landscape of LA. And um, I was asked to do something on the spot where Chris Burden's urban light sculpture normally sits. It's the one with all the street lamps really close together. And in response to that, you know, that sculpture not being there, I kind of looked into the history of that piece um, and found this kind of connection. Um, I'll try not to go too deep into it, but Basically, I decided to make this alternative monument, which is kind of taking all of the objects that had been in the garage of my childhood home that my mom had collected and putting them on this platform. And so thinking of this as kind of like a, a challenging or flipping of this history that had been you know, presented to us as like, this is kind of what you should be celebrating. Um, and that brings me to this notion of absurdity that Cassie talked about. Um, as a way to kind of, you know, minimize the structures that seem to oppress us. And say what you will about the metaverse, I think this was also an aspect of world building and thinking about um, what are the possibilities we can create, which made me think of Adele's project as well. And that is all my thoughts. I have no idea how long that was. I hope it was 15 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> and way to end and what a frankly what a what an honor it is to walk on the same floor as everybody who presented sometimes I uh, sometimes I kind of I wonder like who am I sitting on here to close out a program with all of you and how do I um, honor that and how do I uh, cherish it so thank you I think let's get a round of applause for everybody who presented today <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, now let's get a round of applause for our director, Salome Asega. Um, thank you, everybody. I think uh, in a moment I'll give you some uh, closing notes for our after party. But I think I do want to add a closing for my, um, you know, how I can honor everybody's work. And I think as I was sitting in that audience and I was, as I was actually looking at this floor and actually seeing everybody's uh, footsteps on it, I thought, <laughs> it's nice. It, it survived pretty well, actually. <laughs> um, I really kind of thought about this building. I thought about this kind of parallel conversation between art institutions and like web platforms and how literally, were it not for artists, were it not for people using these platforms and enabling them, literally this building wouldn't exist. I wouldn't be working here, I'd be doing something else. 
And sometimes, as representatives of, the, of an institution, it's uh, humbling to tell ourselves that literally we wouldn't exist if it weren't for you. So please, thank you for all of your work. And uh, I, my career wouldn't be here without you. So I, I really, yeah, it is my life's work. So thank you. Um, closing notes. We have a party in the Sky Room that has a menu lovingly created by Chincharia Un from Krung, Cambodia. She's an excellent chef and she's making the food and the drinks. We have takeaway items that are we're going to unveil uh, over there <laughs> under those <laughs> under those curtains. Um, if you have to run and you can't make it to the reception, please grab a takeaway bag now on your way out. However, if you're staying for the reception, um, we're going to bring one of those tables in the lobby so you can take it on your way out from the reception. So on that note, thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody who presented, who worked on this, who supported the work. Let's, uh, let's have a little party. Thank you. Yeah.